Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you all so much for joining us for the first Funk Family Upstander Speaker Series Program of 2021. I'd like to start by thanking our generous sponsors for this series, Susser Bank, Catherine, and Sam L. Susser. We are so grateful for your support of the museum and our programming. I would also like to extend our thanks to our community partners for tonight's event. AJC Dallas, Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square, Legacy Senior Communities, Refugee Services of Texas, Resource Center, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, and World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Thank you all so much for your support. I would also like to give a warm welcome to our museum members. Your support is crucial to our mission and we would not be able to put on programs like our Funk Family Upstander Speaker Series without you. And as always, I'm very grateful for the support of our wonderful board of directors. I know many of you are watching tonight. Thank you so much for all that you do to support the museum. The Funk Family Upstander Speaker Series is one of the many ways we fulfill our mission at the museum to teach the history of the Holocaust and advance human rights to combat prejudice, hatred, and indifference. In this series, we highlight individuals who stand up for their rights and the rights of others, true upstanders who show us the capacity we all have to make a difference. We are honored tonight to welcome two remarkable individuals with an incredible story, Muhammad Asamawi and Justin Hefter. I know Bonnie Smith is in the audience tonight. Bonnie, thank you so much for introducing us to Muhammad and Justin. Muhammad Asamawi is an interfaith activist, a refugee from Yemen, and the author of best-selling autobiography, The Fox Hunt, a refugee's memoir of coming to America. We will hear tonight about how Muhammad's personal journey led him from harboring a deep suspicion of other faiths to becoming a peace advocate, a commitment that ultimately saved his life. Now settled in the US, Muhammad remains dedicated to the interfaith work through his organization, the Abram Hammock House. Justin Hefter is an entrepreneur and peace builder. He uses technology to bridge social, cultural, and political divides. He was part of the founding team to create the ML Project, an organization that trains the next generation of human rights activists in countries across Africa and the Middle East. Hefter was also the co-founder and CEO of Bandura Games, a company he started with Israeli and Palestinian partners to develop video games as a tool for connecting youth across diverse backgrounds. Justin is currently pursuing a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. We will have time for questions at the end of tonight's program. Please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your questions. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Muhammad al Samawi and Justin Hefter. Gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to Dallas virtually. We had, yeah. we had high hopes that, that we could welcome you um, into our beautiful museum in person, but we really appreciate you being with us virtually. So Muhammad, let's get started with you. Can you tell us about growing up in Yemen and, and what you learned about Judaism and Christianity when you were growing up? Sure, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, before COVID-19 started, I was having a speaking engagement uh, in Dallas and I had an amazing experience at the Holocaust Museum. Um, it was so emotional for me to see the whole journey I love the way the system, how it works in the museum, when you go from a room to another room to another room. And by the end of the tour, I was having all kind of like emotions. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you so much for the important work that you're doing. You. Um, my childhood in Yemen, um, which uh, by the way, I miss Yemen so much. And I hope one day I will be able to 
go back there. I'm sure uh, your family's still there, right, my, Mohammed? My, my family's still there, my friends still there, and a lot of memories is there, so. Sure. Um, my childhood was kind of like, I, I was lucky that I have a parents of, both of them are educated, both of them are medical doctors. Okay. Actually, uh, I, am, uh, I have four siblings, I'm in the middle, I, am, I have two siblings bigger than me and then two siblings younger than me. All of them are medical doctors. Oh my um, goodness. I am the only <laughs> Another one. stream, huh? Yeah, it's kind of like Jewish family who lives in the <laughs> some way. Um, but I am the only one. I am the only one who uh, actually didn't become a doctor because You're of just a peace family. advocate, Muhammad. I know. Yeah, God sometimes has plans for um, like for us that we don't understand. But for me, it was my disability actually who didn't bring me to be in the in the medical field. Um, mm -hmm. And since I was a kid, I was actually feeling kind of like angry from God. Why me? Why did you decide to choose me to have such disability? I couldn't play football. I couldn't ride a bicycle. But in the end, and even though that I was, my parents, because they were educated, they wanted me to have the best education I can have in Yemen. So I was in private school in Yemen. Even though I was in, in a private school, unfortunately, um, I was being kind of taught that uh, I am always the victim and anyone else who is different from us, um, they have kind of like, they don't like us. So for example, if we speak about Jews and Christians, and especially Jews, um, I was always he like hearing all these stories about how Jews, they hate us, how Jews, they want to kill us. One of the stories that I heard in the school is that Jews like foxes. They will smile in your face, but they will try to kill you from the back. And actually that's one of the reasons why I named my store and my the book, The Fox Hunt. Oh my goodness, okay. Wow, and so did you, did, what made you start to question those beliefs? My disability. So as, as I told you, sometimes we have something in our life we don't understand, it's actually a blessing. Uh -huh. My disability was kind of like, since even I was a kid, I was always trying to show other kids that even if I have a disability, I can do things that they can do. And one of these things, for example, learning how to speak English. And when I grow up, I met a Christian teacher in, in Yemen. And me and this Christian teacher, Luke, we became friends. And one day Luke came to me and he told me that he is leaving Yemen in a couple of months. Hmm. I felt a little bit disappointed that this friend, new friend, that he will leave Yemen and I want him to remember Yemen when he go back to his country. So I decided that I want to give him a gift. And I went back home. I started talking to my mom, what kind of gift I should give it to him. I was thinking that maybe I should buy him a Yemeni ring or a Yemeni clothes. But in the end, I realized something, that he is Christian. And back in school, I've been told that anyone who's not Muslim will go to hell, no matter if they are good people or bad people, because they don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad. And from that perspective, I felt like the best gift will, for, will be for him is to convert him to Islam. Because if I convert him to Islam, I will save his life from hell mm. to heaven. And that's the biggest gift, um, gift that you can give to anyone. So I went to him and I gave him a copy of the Holy Book of Muslims, the Quran. And I told him, if you care about our friendship, I want you to read it. At the same time, he gave me the Bible. Uh -huh. And when he gave me the Bible, I promised him that I will also read it. But I went back home. I remember that actually when he gave me the Bible, he hid the Bible with plastic bags because you uh -huh. can't show anyone in Yemen that you have a Bible. Uh, uh, it will have a lot of questions, a lot, a lot of people will investigate about it. So I went back home, hiding from and everyone, started reading the Bible, but he didn't tell me. And also in Yemen, nobody told me that the Bible has Old Testament, New Testament. If you're actually reading the Bible from the beginning, you will actually reading the Jewish Torah. And I didn't know that I was actually reading the Jewish Torah. And the main reason that I was reading the Bible is that I want to find difficult questions that Luke will never be able to answer it. Mm -hmm. So I start from the first page, reading about how God created the earth, how God created the sky, how God created us. And I start thinking, I can ask him hard questions based on that. When I called Luke and I start asking questions, 
he started explaining to me that I'm actually reading the Old Testament and he wanted me to read the New Testament. <laughs> and when I asked him what's the difference, he said, you're reading actually now the Jewish Torah. And when he told me that, I started having kind of a momentum of, I want now to know more than ever actually, why the Jews hate us. Since I have the Holy Book of the Jews, I was thinking that as Muslims, we really believe that the Torah is a Holy Book. But a lot of Imams, they think that the Torah has been shifted by rabbis and they change what's inside the Torah. So to, to, it, it is not holy anymore as we know it. Hmm. I was searching about what kind of things that are not holy. What are kind of things that I can say, aha, my book is much better than this book. And the more that I was reading from the Old Testament and the New Testament, the more that I was fascinated about the similarities between Islam and Judaism especially. And the more that I was reading, I was able to meet Christians in Yemen, but mm -hmm. it was hard for me to meet Jews in Yemen. And in a moment of my life, I decided that I just can't find any phrase in the Torah asking for hate or killing as I've been taught in school. Right. So I want to actually ask Jews themselves, why do you hate us if you have such a wonderful book? And that's how my uh, interfaith journey started. I started searching mm -hmm. for Jews in, in Yemen and it was really hard to speak with them. And then I decided to find Jews on Facebook. And <laughs> the question is how you can find Jews on Facebook. Right. Uh, and it was something new for me. So I started writing uh, the word Israel because I thought anyone who lives in Israel will be a Jew. And I started adding people from Israel as friends. I didn't know how to use Facebook at that time. You can imagine nobody accept my request. It's like something weird. And then I realized that this is not the way how you use Facebook. So I started sending private messages and introducing myself. Mm -hmm. And from that moment, I met someone named Nimrud bin Zayed. Mm -hmm. And Nimrud at that time was living in Israel. And he started answering my questions and introduced me to his friends and introduced me to the interfaith community within the Facebook community. And from that moment, I found the purpose finally of my disability. You see, it's because of my disability, I learned how to speak English. And because I learned English, I was able to meet Luke and since then, I was able to read the Torah, meeting Nimrud online. And finally, I was in, among this interfaith community that speaks about how we can be together, not othering, not to speak about the others as the enemy. So I decided that from that moment on, on Facebook, I will start speaking about what did I find in the Torah? What did I find in the Bible? What did I find in the Quran? The similarities of peace and coexistence. And that's how my interfaith journey started. Amazing. I think your curiosity and open heart played a major role in that too, though. Right. So, so Justin, tell me about your background, your, your upbringing and your life before you met Muhammad. What drew you to interfaith work? Uh, thanks so much, Mary Pat. It's mm -hmm. so great to be here. And, you know, I grew up in, a, in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, in a town called Highland Park in a community uh, not unlike uh, the community that I found in Dallas. Um, and, and as Muhammad said, you know, uh, I've, I've visited Dallas a number of times and uh, just found just some wonderful folks who've made me feel at home, uh, Bonnie Smith and, and Shelly Gallant. Uh, and, and thanks for making me feel at home in Dallas. Um, you know, my Jewish community uh, was, was so integral to my upbringing. Um, but I think as a kid, I probably took being Jewish uh, a bit for granted. Um, you know, most of my friends growing up were Jewish and, and uh, you know, I went to Sunday school and, and Hebrew school um, throughout high school. Um, and it wasn't really until I um, actually had a really painful experience with anti-Semitism uh, when I was around 14 years old. Uh, I uh, was on a pretty intense club soccer team uh, and uh, I broke my arm and I was out of the team for a number of months. And when I came back to the team, we had a bunch of new players. Mm -hmm. And uh, a number of those players used my being Jewish as the reason to bully me. Um, so they called me anti-Semitic slurs. They, um, the worst was one day on, on Adolf Hitler's birthday, they marched around like Nazi soldiers um, in Heiling Hitler. Um, and, uh, the coach didn't, and the coach didn't intervene and, ah, uh, no. I'm so sorry. 
Yeah, and it was really painful. Um, I had this dream of being a professional soccer player. It's like all I'd ever wanted to do was be a pro soccer player ever since I was five years old. Um, and uh, and I had to make this decision as a sophomore in high school. Do I do I stay on this team and really endure um, this abuse? I mean, I'd come home crying every day from practice. Uh, do I stay or, or do I do I quit? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, after a lot of conversations with my, my parents, and my grandparents, I ended up quitting the team. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't a healthy environment for me to be in, and uh, and I, I lost a big part of my identity. I, at that point, soccer was probably my strongest identity. I didn't really know who I was at that point um, until uh, the next summer. My parents sent me on a team tour to Israel, uh, where for the first time in so many months, I finally felt comfortable expressing my myself Jewishly, um, and I made friends with all these wonderful Jewish teens from all over all over the world. Um, and I realized that for, for Jews, Israel is the one place where Jewish people can go to be guaranteed to be safe from anti-Semitic persecution. And I not only wanted that place to exist for my kids and my grandkids, but I wanted a place like that to exist for, for everybody, for Jews, for Muslims, for Israelis, for Palestinians, for people across the LGBTQ spectrum, for every race, creed, et cetera, um, that everyone should have their place. And, and so that became like a almost a find it foundational mission statement for me um, to try to make sure that that happened. And uh, when I got to college um, and found that the relationship between Jewish students and Muslim students was really strained, I made it my mission over those four years to try to build bridges mm -hmm. and really saw miracles happen. So Jews and Muslims, Israelis and Palestinians who had every reason to be suspicious of each other actually developed really meaningful friendships. And so, uh, so once I saw that that was possible, I decided, all right, I'm going to I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna stick around in this interfaith world for a little bit longer. I'm so sorry for that experience, but I'm grateful that you're in this work instead of a professional soccer player. So <laughs> your you mother know, probably is too, right? <laughs> me too. And and I think it's those yeah. mir it's miraculous how those things that at the time feel horrible, right? Yeah. Muhammad growing up with a disability, me experiencing this really sure. painful experience leads you to to where you're supposed to be. Through, through adversity, you, you gain resilience and strength that you didn't know you had. So we see that in our Holocaust survivors, you know, all the time. So um, you two were both sort of growing on your path to do interfaith work. What, how did you meet? Um, you were at a conference in Jordan. What drew you there? And tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, so like, from the Facebook experience, like when I told you I was in the interfaith group on Facebook, it was a great experience, definitely. But until one time there was a war in, in Gaza. And because of the war in Gaza, everyone in, inside the Facebook group became kind of like intense or stressed. So nobody would start to speak to anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. everyone, everyone feeling sad about the situation and start feeling that maybe what I'm feel, what I'm living right now on Facebook, maybe it is fake. Maybe it was just online, but if I meet people in person, it will be different. Mm -hmm. So I decided that uh, from that moment to travel, and I traveled, uh, I started Googling actually on Google about conferences where I can meet Jews. Definitely it would be hard for me to do it in Yemen or the Arab countries, but I found a conference in Bosnia and when I traveled to Bosnia, I met Daniel Binkus, which is one of the four people besides Justin and Megan Natasha helped me out. And from that conference, I went back to Yemen mm -hmm. with whole ideas changed because I met wonderful, actually it was the first time from my life to meet a Jew in person, not only a Jew, but I met the first Jew I met actually, for example, was a Jew, a gay and Israeli. <laughs> like it's three in one from someone from Yemen, like to find all this kind of things. I met Muslim yeah. who doesn't wear hijab. And in Yemen, I've been taught that as a Muslim woman, you need to wear hijab. I met Muslims who doesn't speak Arabic at all. So I started realizing that what I was living in Yemen, it was a small circle and it's not actually the whole truth as I've been told. So when I went back to Yemen, I started feeling the more important to go to more conferences and meet more people. And I traveled to other conferences and I was so lucky that I was in a conference in um, two, is it 2014, 
Justin? Yeah, 2015. 2015. In the beginning of 2015, uh, there was a conference in Jordan uh, called Seeds of Peace. And um, I think, Justin, like, do you remember when we met the first time, like where it was in the lobby, I think? Yeah, we were in line to get coffee, you know, just like standing in line to get coffee in between sessions. Wow. And, so you just never know when you're going to meet someone that changes your life, right? No, not really, actually. I went to him and uh, we started speaking about soccer. Uh, as Justin told you that like his yeah. dream was actually to be a professional uh, soccer player, sure. my dream was always to be playing soccer. Uh -huh. and, uh, this is my favorite game. I know all the players. And when I met Justin, I started actually trying to quiz him a little bit if he's better than me by having <laughs> the, the players and the teams. And we became friends, but uh, I gave him my business card and he gave me his business card. And that's it. I never thought that uh, in one time, Justin will be part of the team who helped me out to be evacuated. And that's what happened. Wow. So. I'm curious, have, were your parents helping you, you know, in this work? Were they supporting you in this? And when, how did they feel about, you know, the changes in your belief system, Muhammad? Sure. Uh, interfaith uh, failed in Yemen is not something that's welcoming at all. Um, right. It's always something that's like, why you are wasting your time with such thing? And like, why it, it's not important at all. And Why aren't you going to medical school? Yeah. yeah, not about medical school, but like yeah. for them, they're afraid that I'm speaking with strangers from different faiths, from different backgrounds. They, they are afraid about what's what's unknown. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I um, even here in the United States, uh, during my speaking engagements, I found students who had the same experience where their parents actually they don't want them to speak, for example, with Muslims or Jews or anyone right. who's different from their own community. Absolutely. From my parents' perspective. You need to understand that my, my parents cares a lot about me. They care a lot about me. And because of my disability, for example, my mom quit working as a medical doctor. Mm. So when I was a kid, she decided that she would stay at home to take care of me. My dad was always with me. So when I started doing my interfaith journey, for them, it was also hard to why Muhammad is doing this. So when I went to them, for example, I told them that I'm going to the, to the Muslim Jewish conference in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. If I tell them that I'm going for interfaith, they will never allow me to go to such conference. Mm -hmm. But I had to actually tell them in, in a different kind of like uh, phrase. So I told them, for example, that I'm going to the conference, not for interfaith, but to represent Islam. And that, you know, there will be a group from Jews and there will be a group from Muslims. And mm -hmm. I will be a member of that group of Muslims. So from that perspective, my parents allowed me to go to the first conference. The second conference, the third conference was of course, a lot of difficult conversations with them. But in the end, I was lucky that they, in the end, they allowed me to go. So, so you two meet at this conference, then you go home. And is this the time that the civil war erupts in Yemen? It hadn't started before the conference? Yeah, while I was in, in Jordan, I, uh, we, I was just hearing news that the Houthis, the Houthis is an extreme group, mm -hmm. uh, it's like the Yemeni version of Hezbollah. They have this disgusting logo which says, this to America, this to Israel, damn the Jews. Mm -hmm. In the time when I was in Jordan, the Houthis arrived and controlled the capital city, Sana'a. And I didn't know how much the situation is ugly. And at that time, I was already receiving threats. And it was like, for me, I was thinking like, you know, should I really leave Yemen or should I stay in Yemen? But I love my country. I love my country so much. And I never thought that it would be far away from my family and my community. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was in Jordan, I just went back to Yemen to, saw, to see the situation. And it was devastating. Uh, the Houthis controlled the police stations. Uh, mm -hmm. They started doing their, like, logo, hating logo about this to America and Jews and Israel mm -hmm. everywhere in the capital city. Everywhere you go, you will see the logo in front of you. Um, they even made the president of Yemen hostage and they didn't allow him to go out from his, uh, from his palace in, in Yemen. So it was a very devastating situation. Mm -hmm. In one moment when I was actually in Aden trying to escape from the war, I was actually a little bit regretting like why I didn't stay in Jordan. 
why did I come back to Yemen? But it uh, it had been for for a reason. Hmm. And and you had no idea what the situation was really like in Yemen at that time. No, I mean Yemen, Yemen always had some conflicts. We never, I never thought it would be going to the rank of civil war. Have you received threats before the war, yeah. Mohammed? Yeah, oh, yeah. you had. Okay. I, I received threats since I started interfaith, and like the first threat, for example, I received is. Uh, someone with the name picture Osama bin Laden on Facebook uh, mm -hmm. and he threatened me. I was actually really scared. I remember when I received my first threat, although it was on Facebook, but I thought that, you know, he will just come and kill me. I was so lucky that I was among other interfaith activists um, around the world on Facebook. When I told them about, for example, the threat that I received, I remember a friend of mine from Sudan named Mohammed Abu Bakr. He told me, like, I need to show you something. And he shared with me a screenshot of his Facebook messages and how many threats he received just by doing interfaith. So he said to me, I remember, welcome to the club. And that definitely was the threats that I'm receiving. And from more being having experience in interfaith, the more that you will not be caring a lot about online threats because you start having a meaning of if they want to kill, to kill me, they will do more than actually posting on Facebook or actually messaging on Facebook. And that's what happened actually. And Just intimidation. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened for me. Like, you know, when the threats changed between Facebook posts to be a phone call and the phone call was actually literally threatening me, not only myself, but also threatening in some way my family. And that's why I decided that I don't want to live near my family because if anyone wants to kill me, and they found my, my family like uh, sitting between me and them, they will hurt my family. Right. So I decided that I want to be far away from my family and I went to another city in Yemen uh -huh. where I thought that I would be safe, but I wasn't safe. I put myself in more dangerous situation because another extreme group like Al Qaeda, for example, was there uh, and I was in, in a big harm. So was, that's when you really felt like your life was in danger and you asked for help. Um, I, start, I started feeling that my life was in danger when Al-Qaeda gave an uh, announcement on, on Facebook saying that anyone from the North, I mean, so you need to understand a little bit the historical and, and, and uh, about Yemen, but uh, I'm from the North of Yemen mm -hmm. and the people in the North of Yemen, they look different from the, the people from the South. Mm -hmm. uh, we have different accents. We have even... Uh, the, uh, different practices in some way. So when I went to the south of Yemen, Al-Qaeda gave announcement that anyone from the north like me, anyone who's Shia background and my, my family background Shia will be killed. And they start actually killing people and taking them as hostages from, from their homes, from the streets. And that's when I start feeling like, okay, this became very, very serious. Uh, I started reaching my family first. Mm -hmm. And I reached my friends and I asked them, can you please help me out? The most dangerous thing was for me is that one of Al-Qaeda checkpoints was just near my apartment, near the building. So I couldn't go downstairs. Now, because of my disability uh, and in, you know, the culture in Yemen, unfortunately, I didn't learn how to cook. So uh, I was having so limited food I never thought that I would be kind of like afraid from going out from my apartment. And then I was hiding in my apartment and I hear Al-Qaeda fighters speaking about, oh, there's someone from the North lives in that building. Let's go kill him and take the money and things like that. Mm -hmm. And all I'm thinking like I could be the next one who they come to. So I started reaching also my organization. I used to work for an organization called Oxfam. Uh, which is a nonprofit organization. I asked them if they can help me out. And unfortunately, when the war started, Oxfam decided to evacuate all the international staff and they left all the local staff like me in the war zone. So nobody actually was able to help me out. Mm -hmm. I started losing hope. I start praying to God and I start thinking like, what should I do? Should I kill myself? Because mm -hmm. the pictures that I was seeing and the videos that I was seeing on Facebook about people like me, is very, very like devastating. And what I'm thinking about like, if my family will see these pictures and videos about me, 
it would be really bad for him. Right. So I decided to do one thing. I decided that I will post on Facebook. And I will reach people on Facebook asking them, can you please help me out? And my, my hope was that someone from my neighborhood, someone from my community will come and help me out. Mm -hmm. I never thought that for Americans, that they barely know each other, they will be able to help me out. Actually, the funny thing is that I did not send um, a request to Justin. Um, what happened is that Megan Hallahan, which is one of the four people, uh, did reach Justin. And Justin, do you mind to speak about that? Yeah, because... have... How'd you get involved, Justin? Tell us. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like Mohammed said, we became Facebook friends after after the event in Jordan. And, you know, just, just you know, I, I essentially forgot about him. Um, and it was really three weeks later. So this is March of, of 2015. So almost exactly six years ago. Um, you know, I was on vacation. I was on a ski trip. And um, I got an email one morning and I look at my phone and uh, it says, urgent, my friend in Yemen. Um, and I'm thinking like, this, this, this has got to be a crazy email. Like, this isn't good. This isn't for me. Um, but I opened it and it was from, from Megan, who I'd met, you know, again, 15 minutes at this conference in Jordan. I'd met her. Um, similarly with Natasha, I saw Natasha, but, but never actually interacted with her. And Megan had written an email, BCC, blind copied to probably hundreds of people. Mm. Uh, it's just kind of a generic form email. Um, I think it turned out later that it was like one of the third of these large group emails, or, you know, not the first large group email that Megan had sent, um, basically saying, can anybody uh, help a friend of mine who's, uh, whose life is in danger in Yemen? He needs to get out. Um, and so I'm like, I, I don't know how to help anybody in Yemen. I, you know, live, I was living in San Francisco at the time. Right. So I was about to delete the email, um, but I paused. And, and I paused because of two things. The first was that I was in the middle of reading a book about the Holocaust, um, a book called In the Garden of Beasts. Um, uh, yeah. and, and all about the US ambassador to Germany in the 1930s, who had all of these opportunities, who could have intervened to stop Hitler's rise, but who didn't, right? It was about all these people who could have done something, but didn't. And as a, as a young Jewish person, I didn't want to say no to somebody whose life was in danger. And the second thing was that this was so recently after I'd met Muhammad, I still had Muhammad's business card in my wallet. I, I realized I know someone in Yemen who might be able to help Megan's friend. Right. <laughs> Megan didn't say who the friend was. Um, so I write Megan this email back saying, hey, listen, I, I don't think I can help your friend, but here's the contact information for this interfaith activist in Yemen named Muhammad al-Samawi. Maybe Muhammad can help your friend. Yeah. Uh, and I thought I'd done you know, my civic duty. I thought I was done with the whole thing. Um, and Megan responds, it is Muhammad. Um, that's whose life's in danger. And, and so at that moment, you know, it was no longer a stranger. I mean, it was someone who's I, I, it was someone who I'd met, I, you know, I knew his face, I knew his name, I knew his voice, um, you know, and I couldn't, I couldn't sleep knowing uh, that Muhammad, uh, Muhammad's life was in danger. And so I, I, I said to Megan, I'm, I'm in, you know, how can I help? Wow. So then, so you build this network of four amazing people. Tell me about, and you, you had just barely met Megan, didn't meet Natasha. Had you met Daniel before? I'd never, I'd, I'd never met Daniel. Yeah. So I was at, so Megan Call, um, Hallahan, Daniel Pincus, and Natasha Westheimer, and you set about trying to save Muhammad. How, tell me how you came together and how you, you know, worked as a team and, and coordinated with each other. It was, it was pretty haphazard at first. Uh, <laughs> I think it was actually Muhammad that made the connection. So um, Muhammad started out, he sent an email out to, uh, and not just the four of us, a number of other people on this email, people who had said, okay, I, I'm happy to help. Um, and, uh, and so we just started emailing ideas back and forth. Muhammad would give us a, an update in the morning. You know, here's how much food I have left. Here's how much water I have left. Here's how, how close the bombings are to us. Um, and people just started throwing ideas out. And what was really, and, and none of us knew who we were. So, you know, you've got, you've got Daniel saying, hey, I, I know this, I got, I'm in touch with this guy in the military. Uh, wants to fly a helicopter in for, you know, $50,000. And, you know, Megan's like, I know some folks at the State Department, um, uh, you know, who might be able to help. Natasha's like, I'm reaching out to folks uh, and governments all over the world who might be able to help. 
uh, and I'm like, I, my, my senator, uh, my former senator, Mark Kirk from Illinois, um, who, or my former congressman, now senator, who I'd interned for in 2006, maybe he could be able to help. And so we're all just throwing these ideas um, to see what, what sticks. Um, and eventually got on a Skype call, you know, before Zoom, uh, which was pretty innovative. We all got on a call and started coordinating with each other to try to uh, figure out the right path. Amazing. So did, did you have hope and confidence that you could figure something out? And I mean, what, what drove you to, to keep working on, on this? other than having met Muhammad, who's amazing. You know, I, I, think, I think I was probably maybe the most optimistic one and maybe yeah. the most naive um, of, of the group. Um, and, you know, we, we would get on a Skype call with, with Muhammad and, uh, you know, you could hear the bombs falling in the background on those calls. Um, mm -hmm. I remember at least once Muhammad having to drop off because the fighting had gotten so close. Sure. Um, and, what was also crazy about the whole thing was that, you know, I was in San Francisco, Daniel's in New York, Megan and Natasha are in Tel Aviv. We literally had a 24 seven operation. I went to sleep, Megan and Natasha are awake working. Megan and Natasha go to sleep, I'm, I'm working. And I think, you know, we really built a, a camaraderie amongst us, amongst this group of people where we knew that we could sleep for four hours, three hours uh, and, and not have to worry for those hours because the other people in New York, Tel Aviv, you know, had had picked up the ball, and I think we kept each other going in in those really uh, those really difficult moments. So amazing, and and Muhammad, you're there all by yourself. I mean, you're able to communicate with them, but otherwise, you're alone in this apartment for 13 days. Is that right? After you contacted them? No, I mean, I was since I contacted them, it took it took 13 days to be evacuated from okay. from Yemen. But, so, what was it like going through that? What were you? What were you thinking, and were you hopeful? I, I, I had I had um, like sneakers. You can, you can say like I had some chips. I had some tuna. Uh, that was like my food, kind of like daily food. Um, the most amazing thing for me is that like these four people specifically gave me hope, uh -huh. while others they don't. Imagine like how many people I reach out asking them for help. Mm -hmm. I reach out from even people from my own community and asking them to help me out. These people are far, far away from me. Some of them, like Justin, for example, I spoke with him only for a few minutes. Uh, Daniel, I met him in Bosnia while he was dancing break dance. Uh, <laughs> and then me and him became like just friends and high and by. Actually, you know, when you ask Daniel, do, do you remember Mohammed from the conference? He will tell you like, no, I don't remember him. The amazing thing for me that these four people, even though they don't know me that well, they were able to give me the hope that I needed to survive. So every time I was give up, I remember for example, like I was hearing the bombs just near my home and I just felt like I need to speak with someone. And in such situation, you don't want to reach your family because you, you, you don't want them to feel uh, intense about you. You want my, your family to be more comfortable as much as they can. So I, built this kind of like heavy weight on them, on the four people. I remember I was reaching Daniel and tell him about the bombs and like what that I'm afraid. And he responded to me, even though it's like two o'clock at, um, at morning in Manhattan time. And then I read Justin and Justin, like instead of telling me like, um, text me or something like that, he just said like, let's have a call. And he wanted me to hear my voice and just to keep me calm. These kind of things that makes really the difference. I realized when I been in touch with these four people that they don't have any experience in evacuation. Right. They don't know a lot of things, actually almost zero about Yemen. <laughs> they, Where there's a will, there's a way though, right? Yeah. I, I had to, to explain to them like what's the meaning of being Shia and Zaidi and what's meaning North and South and what's wow. happening with the Houthis and Al-Qaeda and all these things. Right. But the amazing kind of world that they had, um, I was trusting them 100%. And things that they were telling me, for example, that doesn't make sense at all. And I started asking myself, like, they didn't know what they're doing. <laughs> 
but that they were the best you had, right? Yeah, that's that because they believed on me. I believed on them, and right. I believe that no matter what they will say to me, there could be hope, and mm -hmm. it happened. Like who who thought that these four people would be able to reach two countries, two senators, two people from all over the world, and asking them to help me out? And because of them, I'm sitting with you today here, and. Um, it's so inspiring, you know, because at the museum, we talk a lot, you've seen me visited about the importance of being an upstander, but we, you know, it, it's scary to be an upstander. And sometimes you put yourself at risk and it's dangerous to be an upstander, but it's, um, you have to, taking that step, once you were in it, you were, you were on the path and committed, right, Justin? So tell me, how did you actually get out of Yemen. And I know, I mean, we could, I, I, I'm watching the time. I, I want to I get to, to what you're doing today, but the audience has to know how you got out of Yemen and, and the path that you took to get to the United States. Sure. It's, it's, it's a very long story and, <laughs> and forgive me for jumping from a place to a place, but definitely reading the book will give the, the, full, the full picture. Escaping from, from Yemen, it happens because these four people was able actually to reach people from the State Department and reach people from different countries and asking them, can you please take Mohammed with you? Uh, so with, with the help of Senator Mark Kirk, who Justin mentioned, and other people, other officials, uh, they were able to actually contact India. And the Indian government uh, made me part of their evacuation plan. So on Passover of 2015, I actually crossed the Red Sea um, by an Indian military ship from Yemen to Djibouti. Um, it's like Moses in some way, but in the <laughs> wrong direction, like, you know, yeah. to Djibouti. So I escaped from, from Yemen with nothing. I didn't have luggage. I didn't have anything. Wow. The last memory that I had from my country is that I was seeing my country on fire. It was at night and I see the bombs, I see the fire everywhere. And we are going away, far away from the land. When we arrived to Djibouti, and this is the beautiful thing about the story actually, is that whenever I was going to a place, there was a problem happens. Um, and, but these four people, they never give up. So mm -hmm. for example, when I was in Djibouti, we were the first kind of like Yemeni group to escape from the war in Yemen and the Djibouti government, they didn't know what to do with us. Mm -hmm. As a Yemeni citizen, you need to have a, a visa to enter Djibouti. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know what to do. So they put us on in jail in, mm -hmm. in a police station. Mm -hmm. Now, anyone else will say, listen, he already out from Yemen. Let him figure it out by himself. Not these four people. For example, Daniel, posted on his Facebook asking people, do, do, do you know anyone in Djibouti? Mm -hmm. And a friend of him from a Jewish organization in Belgium said, I know someone from Sierra Leone who used to work in Djibouti. And this person contact a friend of him in Djibouti. And fair enough, like, you know, after a few minutes, this person came to the jail shouting, where is Mr. Mohammed Samawi? I was out from the jail just by not giving up on me and just posting about me. I remember when I was out of out of jail um, and I out of like to, to Djibouti, they didn't give up on me. Again, anyone else would say like, okay, he's in Djibouti now, let him figure it out. They didn't. They were contacting me every day, um, always asking about me. Uh, I remember Daniel, for example, asked me, do you have money? And I was really didn't, I don't know him very well. Like, you know, I don't want to tell him even about my financial situation. And it was so fascinating for me, like, you know, how you're speaking about the Holocaust, for example, and uh, I had actually to give a watch of mine, like my watch, to mm -hmm. someone to just to escape from the port in Yemen. Right. And Daniel told me about his grandmother, you know, who had to escape, you know, the Holocaust by actually giving things to people, like just to, to escape and just to be in a, in a safe place. So the history in some way repeated and when I was asking Justin, when I was asking Daniel, I'm like, why are you helping me? All of them are related to me in some way because their grandparents and like their family suffered from the Holocaust and suffered from what happened to them. And they heard from their families that I wish if there was someone helping me. 
And they, Daniel, for example, told me that, you know, I want to be the person who never say no to someone and like be able to help others. Um, and that's what happened. I actually was able to stay in Djibouti for around a month. Um, and then these four people, amazing people asked me, do you want to come to the United States? I said, are you kidding? Of course I want to come to the United <laughs> States. The question is, yeah. is how. Right. And I remember like Justin, for example, gave me an invitation from Stanford University. Like I was hearing about Stanford from movies in, in Yemen. Like I never thought that I would have an invitation from a university like this. Mm-hmm. Um, I received an invitation from the American Jewish Community, AGC. Uh, and like I said, like, you know, like how even the American Jewish Community knows about me and they want me to invite me. I received like seven, eight invitations to come to the United States. Wow. I went to the NBC the American embassy in Djibouti with dirty clothes. Um, I was in a very bad shape. I didn't have any bank statements. I didn't have any documentations except my passport. Oh. And I had the seven, eight invitations. And I thought that they would never give me the visa. They gave me the visa. And, and from then I came to United States. Um, the first place I stayed, I stayed actually at Justin apartment. I remember when Justin actually um, decided that he would sleep in the couch and he would let me sleep in the bed. Um, and at that moment, I start feeling like the hard time that happened to me. Um, so one time Justin like entered into the, the room just to say hi. And I thought he is a kind of fighter. So I start shouting on him. Mm. Um, and from that moment, like I realized that I'm actually safe and I start re- trying to relax. Uh, yeah. But that's, that's how I came to that stage. So it's an amazing story. And it, it's, it just shows the power, you know, that each of us have that we, we really don't realize, you know, until we're pressed into action. I mean, can, can you two tell me or tell our audience how this experience changed you and, and your motivation for the rest of your life and you know the work that you're doing today. How, how are you working to make sure that you are helping others today? Um, from my perspective, like I, there is a phrase in the Quran that says, who saves a life saves the whole world. And it's the same phrase that you will find it also in the Talmud. Uh, right. And when, when, when they helped me out to be, to be here in the United States, I'm trying to help others. And, in several ways, the most important thing that interfaith for me. Through interfaith, I can speak about anti-Semitic, I can speak about Islamophobia. I was a person who been um, facing Islamophobic attacks just because my name is Mohammed. Uh, I uh, actually, in a Justin Wedding, an, an Uber driver, she kicked me out from her car because my name is Mohammed, for example. Oh my goodness. Like yeah. that. Uh, so I decided that I, um, I wanted to continue my interfaith journey and the most amazing thing about the United States, and I, I hope people in America, they realize that, is that it's amazing that in America, if you are different, if you have different opinion, if you have different ideology, different thinking, nobody will come and kill you because you're different. In Yemen, it's something different. Uh, you can't do interfaith, for example, in public. So I became kind of like in, uh, in a, bar- a paradise of interfaith. Instead of doing interfaith anymore in online, I started mm-hmm. doing interfaith in, in public. Um, I was able to read, uh, to write the, the Fox Hunt. Uh, and um, there's a movie actually happening right now about uh, the, the, the Fox Hunt. Um, Very exciting. When do you, uh, when's the movie coming out, do you know? We don't I guess know. COVID slowed that down, huh? Yeah, it could it could it could take like a year, two years, something like that. But uh, we, we are very lucky that the, the movie is produced by Mark Platt, uh, uh, who did La La Land, and Steven Spielberg also is a producer of uh, of the movie. Wow. But the most important thing for me, I think, from my activism is creating the Abrahamic House, and the Abrahamic House is an organization where I let people from different faiths to live together. Mm-hmm. not just doing events, but they live together. And while they live in together, they can reflect it in the community by speaking about things that, are with, that really matter to us. Mm-hmm. Um, we speak about issues that reflect us and instead of othering the others, we're gathering everyone. 
and we can speak about how we can unite, um, unite, unite, unite us. Actually, the idea of Abrahamic House came from a Jewish organization uh, called Moshe House. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. It was the first in Muhammad, Dallas, right? Mm -hmm. It was the first Muhammad ever I should speak at uh, Moshe House. And when I went to Moshe House, it's a Jewish organization where you will have four, five, six Jews living together. And I thought that's a great idea why you don't create the same thing, but instead of being Jews, could be people from different faiths. Right. Wonderful. And Justin, how about you? I mean, my life is profoundly changed uh, as a result of having met Muhammad and been involved in his escape. And, you know, really, my, you know, I, I think there are two things that really are different. Um, you know, first of all, Muhammad really saved himself. I mean, he found a way to get through checkpoints, Al-Qaeda checkpoints, where they were looking for people like him. He traded his watch to get on that boat. Um, but when we were contacting experts and folks in the military and governments, NGOs, and like Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook, everybody told us that it was impossible. Everybody said, no way. It, the war in Yemen is so bad. The Navy SEALs have left. You know, it, you can't get somebody out of Yemen. Um, it's impossible. Um, and the fact of the matter is the, the, the five of us were able to, to do the impossible. Um, and so I think what that showed me was as a young person, I was 25 years old, um, that, that, you know, when people tell you something's impossible, don't believe them. Um, you know, and, and that actually from your couch in San Francisco, you can actually make a difference on the other side of the world. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and so, so I think that was a really big lesson. And, um, you know, when Muhammad finally arrived in San Francisco, I got to see the United States through his eyes, through the eyes of someone who had so much gratitude for every little thing. It was one of the coolest couple of days, um, you know, uh, for Muhammad to really experience freedom and, and for me to experience the freedom of this country uh, with him. Um, so that was really beautiful. Uh, and, and after this experience today, um, Megan Hallahan and I actually worked together um, so Megan uh, and, and Muhammad Abu Bakr, Muhammad uh, mentioned uh, as one of the people he reached out to, um, where we, um, uh, the three of us help and a whole bunch of other folks uh, help start an organization to train uh, the next generation of activists, the next generation of people who are gonna change the world um, and hopefully more people like, uh, like Muhammad al Samawi. And is that the appeal, um, a different, right? Yes, so that's that's the ML project. The, the, the ML project. The Thank you. Project. The ML project. You know, when I was kind of you know preparing for this talk, I I read about the ML project and saw the other Muhammad talking about how Americans take democracy for granted. Um, it was it you know it, it, particularly during this time, what it, what democracy really means was was compelling to me. And so, Muhammad, I'm sure that was was eye-opening to you. Um, but it was probably scary at first too to trust that you really could, you know, be safe being in, in interfaith work and and expressing yeah. who you really were. But it's it's a very glassy situation. Like for example, I was in Washington D.C. when uh, when the um, the attack happened against the Senate, uh, for example, and. This just reminds me exactly what happened in Yemen. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in 2014, the Houthis entered the Yemeni parliament and they start taking pictures of them being in the offices and show off. Wow. And I saw the exact, the exact thing happening in the United States in 2021. Wow. So this was a little bit crazy for me. And I like what you just said about what Mohammed Abu Bakr said, which is like, democracy is not granted and like you know we need to keep working on it and we need mm -hmm. to to make sure that we can save what we have the freedom that we have actually it's very mm -hmm. it's very very important and by not doing the work for example the work of interfaith it's very important more than ever because we live right now in a situation where everyone likes to othering the others or blaming the others i actually literally see a lot of people like trying to um, speak that say the Jews actually is the reason of what happened in the Senate. I heard that. Yeah. I heard people who was trying to blame the Muslims and like unless if we do our own action. Right. We're attacking Asian Americans for the coronavirus. I know yeah. it's a but, but like, your work is very important. But what I want 
what I really want people to understand is that these four people who helped me out, it didn't take from them to be a, a, like Superman or Batman. It didn't take from them to be having a special knowledge on how to help someone from Yemen. It take from them the willing to help. And that's what we need to do. Uh, I hope everyone thinking that, you know, we can actually make everything better by trying and not give up. Um, Very inspiring. This happening also for me, like, you know, with my disability, mm -hmm. if I wanted really to just be satisfied and have easy life, I would believe of what, uh, what I learned back in school. <laughs> and you wouldn't ever see me here in the United States or you never, you never know that I am an interfaith activist. Oh, I but I decided that I would do something which is uncomfortable. And today I'm here yeah. with you. We're all the better for it. And it was terrifying, but I'm, I'm so, it's such a wonderful story and Justin, so inspirational that you, you know, leapt to help and, and made such a huge difference. And I'm, I'm just really grateful that you've written the book and that the film's coming out, Muhammad, and so we can share your story with so many more people and inspire them. I think we better let the audience ask a couple of questions or I'm going to be in trouble. I could keep talking to you guys forever. Um, but I, the, um, the first one that I've seen is, um, and you've already alluded to this a little bit, Justin, but what was it like when Muhammad finally got there and, and you were reunited and how did it feel, you know, to see him and have him in your home? You know, I, it all became real in that moment. Um, you know, I've said in the past, you know, we were on our, the whole operation, we were on our laptops, right, on our couches in San Francisco, New York. Tel Aviv, um, you know, looking at Google Maps, trying to figure out the right path from Muhammad's apartment to the sea. Could a helicopter get from Kenya to uh, to to uh, to Yemen? And it felt like playing a video game. It, it really, it was, you know, it was it was yes, it was emotional, but it was also somewhat depersonalized, right? Muhammad was this action figure that we were just kind of trying to help point in the right direction as best we could. Um, and it really wasn't until he got there in the United States and, you know, I felt like we were done, you know, the day Muhammad made it to Djibouti, I, I was exhausted. I'd been up for, you know, almost 48 hours and, and was like, all right, we did it right. He's, he's there, he's safe. Then when he came to the United States, um, you know, we gave our first talk at Stanford and you saw the reaction on people's faces, how inspired they were by the story, um, how people who might be distrustful. There was a, a student from Saudi Arabia whose government is, is you know, deeply complicit in the war in Yemen, um, uh, said, wow, Muhammad, like, that's incredible. I'm so sorry. So we saw the reactions of people and I realized this isn't the end. This is really just the beginning. Um, and so that's, that's yeah, that, that all changed when Muhammad arrived. You really had a responsibility to share this, to inspire others. Muhammad, um, several people are, are worried about your family. You said your family is still in Yemen. Are they safe there? Um, yeah, actually like today, just I, uh, I, I had a wonderful conversation with my, with my mother. So I am, I am in touch with my, with my family, um, but it's, uh, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, it's complicated because I live here in the United States. The story, even though that the book is not translated into Arabic, Mm -hmm. A lot of people in Yemen learned about the story and what happened to me and all these things. Uh -huh. So they start giving all this like uh, uh, stereotypes to my family and like lies. And one of the lies that my family heard about me that Muhammad is gay and uh, Muhammad is not a Muslim anymore. He became Jewish uh, and all this kind of like rumors. And this put my family in a very bad situation. So. I am in touch with my family. I hope one day my family will be out from, from Yemen. And like, to be honest with you, the last four years was a little bit hard for me because Yemen was having no attention from any kind of people from the government in the United States, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the war in Yemen is getting deeper and deeper and from bad to worse. And people uh, are like, starved, being starved to death. Is the worst humanitarian like crisis in the whole world? Just today, actually, the World Food Organization just said that Yemen is the worst place to live in the whole in the, in the hell earth. 
Wow. So imagine like when I am with you right now in the United States, I know for a fact that I have some food in my fridge. Like what about my family? Right. When I talk with my mom and I tell her like how much I'm worried about her, she told me I'm worried about you. <laughs> um, now I, I have, uh, because we were speaking about my family. Um, when I was actually threatened, I had to go to Aden. And my mom and my dad, everyone was like, what's happening with you? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. And then in one time, I thought that that's it. Like it would be the end of my life because Al Qaeda just was, saw me actually. And mm -hmm. they investigated with me. And I thought that this is the end. So I called my mom to tell her, to tell her goodbye. And my mom was crying and like she couldn't like imagine what could happen to me. A few later on, I, she knew that I was in a hotel in Aden escaping from that apartment. After okay. that, she heard that I was in Djibouti. And suddenly I was in Manhattan. When I, when I spoke with her that, that day, I was in Manhattan. I was actually at Daniel apartment. And she told me like, okay, hold on. You can't just tell me like you're moving from place to place. You need to tell me, are you okay? And what happened? Mm -hmm. so I told her like, mom, I can't tell you everything. It's a long story, but I need to tell you something though. The people who helped me out, they're not Muslims. They're actually people from different faiths. And like, I'm sitting right now with, with Daniel, who is actually Jewish. And I will never forget, my mom gave me a hard time when I was in Yemen about interfaith, not because she from a hateful perspective, it's more from a protective perspective. But when I told her that I was with Daniel and she told me, I don't care like if you're Jewish or atheist or anything like that, I just want to hug him and kiss him and tell him, please, yeah. thank you so much for, for being able to help you out. So this is the situation with my family. I hope to be reunited with my family uh, this year. Um, with COVID-19 situation, it's, it's hard mm -hmm. that there's no airport in Yemen. It's really hard for my family to travel. They will have to have struggling time as I had struggling time to leave Yemen just okay. to meet me. Uh, I hope I will be able to find a safe place for my family. It's a big responsibility. Um, but the most important thing, I'm always asking myself, Daniel, Justin, Megan, Natasha, and others was able to help me out even though that I was stranger to them. Yes, I have a big family, but it is responsibility for me to be able to, to help them. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people tell me like, you know, you are in the United States and you have this and that, like, you know, you just need to start moving on. I can't move on. Mm -hmm. I will not be able to move on until I, I make sure that my family will be safe. Well, it sounds like you have a wonderful network of friends that can be helpful with that too. Yeah. So, <laughs> Justin, you get back on the on the job here. <laughs> so can you to um, you know give advice? I mean we always hope that we have you know families and young people um, joining us for these talks. What advice would you give to young people about how to get involved with interfaith work? I have three advices, like which is the most important advices for me is the first one is that, first of all, don't feel shame that you are different. Mm -hmm. Don't feel that, you know, because you have a disability or you don't have a lot of friends that, you know, you are a burden on your family or burden on anyone. Look to me, I mean, with my disability, I was able actually to come here. My disability actually is a blessing in my life. So don't give up, don't say that, you know, uh, it's a bad situation. You never know from what kind of bad situation you will have a better situation. So that's the first advice. Um, the second advice is that uh, the four people again who helped me out, it didn't take from them any kind of like money or something like that. It took from them the willing to help me out. So if you really believe in something, you'll be able to help and be part of it. They helped me out. I was far, far away from them. I didn't know how even to communicate with them very well. I was learning actually to use Google Map first time in my life through them. They teach me how to use Google Map when I was in Yemen. Mm -hmm. And um, the third thing and the most important thing is that don't believe anything you've been taught. Always be able to ask questions. And if people tell you don't ask questions, you need to understand that there's something wrong there and people are afraid from you to ask questions. So keep asking questions. 
because very if good you advice. Can ask the questions, you will have the answers. Very good advice. Justin, what, what would you like to add to that? Oh, goodness. That was so wonderful, Muhammad. Um, <laughs> I have very little. I'd say get involved with Abrahamic House. Um, you know, get involved with the ML project. Uh, I think the biggest uh, thing, the biggest quality, maybe the most important quality of, of an interfaith activist is the capacity to listen, the capacity to be curious about others. Uh, Muhammad, as you can tell, is one of the most curious people that you will ever meet. Uh, you know, he wanted to learn English. He wanted to know more about Jews. He wanted, you know, he just always wants to know more. He's always asking questions about people. He's, he, you know, figured out the system in the United States so quickly um, because of that open heart and curiosity to learn about other people. Um, so, you know, don't assume you know because of someone's political statement or because of, you know, their Facebook profile or uh, their party affiliation that you know where they where their heart is. Um, and, and so approach people with love and with curiosity. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'd say, say yes, say yes to opportunities. Um, I would I would just add one last thing is that you don't need like and, and and thank you so much like Justin I agree with you like be involved with the Abrahamic House and be involved with ML Project but you don't and need I see that Annie has posted those in the for all of our participants to see so that's good but but you really don't need to be belong to any organization to be involved in interfaith you can do interfaith by your own mm -hmm. go to see your neighbor uh, if you have a neighbor from uh, community and the faith different than you, invite them for coffee yeah. and just be open-minded. Don't think that, you know, you have the privilege and advantage, you know, to ask them questions. Don't do that. Just be friends with them. Let them welcoming you to their lives. And they will tell you, listen, I came, I came here as, as, a, as a refugee and I was so lucky that I was able to have Daniel Bingos, Justin, Megan and Tasha in my life. Because even when I came back to, when I came to United States, they became the family of me. Now, imagine how many refugees they come to United States where they don't have family like that. They don't have anyone at all. And they live in United States where people start telling things about them as they take their, your job. They hate you because of your faith and all that, that things. Don't believe what people tell you. Don't let third person be barred from you and the other person. Go to them and speak to them, invite them for coffee. Trust me, uh, I was actually speaking with Justin one time and he told me, Muhammad, I'm thinking to write a book about Uber driver stories. And I told him, what do you mean? And he said, Uber drivers, they have the most interesting stories ever. And I said, that's <laughs> A lot of immigrants, a lot of people from different faiths when they work that's when they true. come especially to the United States, they don't have the opportunity to tell their own stories. I had the chance to tell my story. Yeah. And people think that, oh my God, you have a wonderful story. Thank you, but I think there is a more bitter story than my story, but they've uh -huh. never been told. And you'll be able to see the, to hear the stories from the sources. Just go have coffee with them. We just have to, to be curious and ask and listen, right? The, the one, one, question before we'll wrap this up. I have two more questions because I want to fit these in. But, but this is an, was an interesting question to me. So it's, do you think the virtual ways we connect with each other now, um, and you know, in some ways that's how you all were connecting vir were virtually, but do you think it makes it easier or harder to truly understand each other across lines of difference? You know, uh, Facebook connected you, I, I, which is a, Wonderful, because I'm, I find myself focusing on the, the dangers of social media, but in this way, it was used for good. But what do you think about the so, virtual world? So fr from my perspective, like, you know, without Facebook, I wouldn't even start doing interfaith. I was able to reach the first Jews in my life through Facebook and right. asking questions through Facebook and asking even for help for help through Facebook. Uh, I'm now connecting with a big interfaith community through Facebook. So, but if we speak about virtually through interfaith specifically, I would say much, much better than even do it in person. And do it in person, like without virtually, it's good because you can have the momentum and the connection in person when you see face to face and touch and like talk and that's right. different for sure. 
but for example, for Ibrahimic House, um, we were able to have people from Saudi Arabia. We had people from Turkey and attending my, our events. We had people from France asking us to open their own houses in France and in Europe. Um, we just have uh, an article posted about us in China, in Chinese. And like all this happened because our events was able to do virtually and people be able to attend that. Now imagine without that, right. we will not be able to do it. We will That's be right. in-, in well, You wouldn't world. be with us tonight, right? We will be just like, no, I mean, like I wish to be able to I be wish with you could. in person definitely, but yes, I agree right. with you. Like, yeah. uh, um, so for me, I think the future, it definitely will be virtual in a lot of ways. But that doesn't mean that the personal connection is not important. It's very, very important. I miss, for example, like being with Justin and you know being with uh, with a lot of people, like you know, in in person. I hope it will happen soon. Yeah. Justin, how about you? Because you've started the the company, the the video game company, is all is sort of a, connecting people virtually. Yeah, I mean, my answer to that question is such a great question. A lot of people are grappling with this question. Um, you know, technology like is, is, is a tool. These platforms are a tool and it really depends on how, how you use them. Um, and, you know, video games for many, many years were something that people did for entertainment. Uh, and then a few folks around the world kind of was like thinking, hey, you know, all these people are playing games with each other from across the world. Why don't we use that as a platform, you know, as, as a peace building platform? Um, same, same tool, just, just different use. And I think you know, at the policy level, you know, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the governments, they're, they're gonna duke it out. But I think that the, the future, the answer to that question is gonna come from how each of us decide to use these platforms. Um, you know, we see the arguments that happen on Facebook. We see, um, you know, the power that anonymity provides people to say really nasty things to each other. Um, and so I think if we want these tools to really fulfill their fullest potential of creating connection, in the way that it did for me and Muhammad and Daniel and Megan and Natasha and you know all of these people who would never have an opportunity to be in the same room. It's how we use it. The 150 people or so on this, uh, you know, watching this video, watching this live stream, you know, when when you see hate, uh, you know, offer love, um, and and it's really it's really up to all of us to make sure that these. It's not up to Facebook. It's up to us on how how we're going to use it. Well, um, for the last question, you know, I, I'd like to first say that that you two both give me incredible hope for our future. Um, I'm interested in in what gives you hope for the future. Uh, I'll go first, and maybe sure. let Muhammad have the last word. Okay. Um, I, I think people like Muhammad <laughs> give me hope. I mean, it's you know, I haven't seen Muhammad in a year. Um, in person, um, and even just this experience now is so beautiful um, to have this opportunity to share this story and relive this incredibly profound experience of, of a person who had every reason to stay in the box, to stay comfortable, to you know not explore, not not build bridges, and who um, really Muhammad inspires me every day with 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 what with what he's able to do, and so I'm. I, I have hope because I have seen the miracles in the world. I've seen the ability for people to change. We are not static beings. Um, you know, the way things are today are not the way they're gonna be tomorrow. Um, uh, and, and so knowing that, having seen that, having seen the impossible happen, um, you know, when I hear the story, I'm, I'm, and I talk to Muhammad, I'm reminded and inspired. And so, um, you know, if you're seeking hope, I'd say, you know, Read the book, but also talk to those people in your life who, who've changed, you know, who um, who you've seen demonstrate that incredible human capacity to uh, to shift perspective and, and to open their hearts. So beautiful. So, yeah. um, I, I would say, like, honestly, being alive, it's a hope for me. Um, I never thought, honestly, that I would make it out from the apartment in Aden. I thought that I would be killed, killed there. Um, being here with you guys every day since I escaped from Yemen every day I wake up and I say am I in dream like is it true that I made it out like until now I, I don't understand how I was able to escape yeah. 
I think God play a big role on it to be able to escape. But I mean, I had KFC in the United States. Uh, <laughs> and I, I had, uh, which is not the best food, but like I, what I want to say is that I had new food in my life that I never thought that I would eat it. I had uh, used Uber. I used, uh, watched movies through Netflix and other things, which is like a crazy <laughs> thing for me. Like I was not able to do that in Yemen. Wow. And all these kind of things that just like gave me hope of like a bitter, even with coronavirus situation, with COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, which is definitely a hard situation for everyone. And I'm, I'm feeling really bad for um, people who lost members of their families. I lost my uncle because of COVID-19. Um, because of COVID-19, for example, I was able to have more time reflecting on myself. I was able actually to contact with more people that I was not having the opportunity to contact with them. And even just realizing what happened to me in, in Yemen, I was just able to realize it right now while I was in, in my home with COVID-19 situation. So I have hope of the future. And because I'm a big believer in God, and I believe that God always has a plan for us, uh, I, I have to be having hope. Gentlemen, it's been a delight. Mohammed, Justin, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I mean, your commitment to peace building is so inspirational and you epitomize what it means to be an upstander. So thank you so thank much you. for being with us. Yeah. We, we, we need to do like a, another Zoom meeting maybe when the, when the movie out. Uh, yes, and that's a <laughs> All the people who who been part of that being there. That would be wonderful. Well, I can't wait. I, I'd be curious to see who plays both of you. So um, I'll start thinking about that. Um, so um, I also, before we close, just want to thank again our series sponsors, Susser Bank and Catherine and Sam L. Susser. We're so grateful for your support. Thank you for all of you joining us tonight. Have a good night and think about what makes what you're hopeful for.